So today we're gonna go over your bloodborne pathogens. Uh, when you guys go into healthcare, you're gonna do bloodborne pathogens. Actually, you'll do this every year for whatever job that you're doing because it is so important. Even us here at school, as teachers and stuff, actually have to go through bloodborne pathogen training. So we're gonna talk about that today. All right. So OSHA um, is the one, you know, occupational safety and health. Now they are the ones who actually make all these rules and regulations about what we're supposed to do because you know they're all about workplace safety things like that so we're going to talk about um, all the different diseases you can catch through someone else's blood and we're talking about how to protect yourself and things like that how to dispose of anything that has these products on it things like that so here at school or in the clinical setting because you guys are trained in first aid you actually can catch a bloodborne disease, which is why we're doing this training. Because if you have even a patient while you're at clinicals who needs a Band-Aid because they cut themselves, even something that simple will expose you to someone else's blood and therefore expose you to a bloodborne pathogen. Um, cleaning restrooms, I don't know why you would be doing that, but you know, it, it's that is a place that Someone might contact that. That's why you'll see even housekeepers in, 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 in the facilities and the hospitals and stuff get this training. Using a tool covered with dried blood. Could happen. If a coworker sneezes on you or another student, right? Here. So what we're gonna talk about today is just the basic basics of bloodborne pathogens. We're gonna talk about exposure prevention and then we're gonna have a quiz at the end. Okay, you guys will need a, um, like I told you before, you'll just need a blank piece of paper that you will answer these questions on when we get to the slides at the end. Now, when we talk about bloodborne pathogens, um, a pathogen is kind of a, a bad germ, okay? It's a, it's a germ that's gonna actually cause a disease. So, um, basically, the one, and if it's bloodborne, where is it found? Oh, you guys are so smart. Okay, good. All right, so one of the main ones that we think about first and foremost is HIV. HIV can be um, shared through blood. Hepatitis B, that's a big one. Have any of you had, uh, actually most of you have had, and that was something we looked at even to be in this program, was if you had had your hepatitis B vaccine series. Now, as young as you guys are, you had your first H, uh, hepatitis B immunization before you left the hospital when you were born. And then you had one like, you know, a couple months later, and had one like six months after that. So within your first year of life, you already had your Hep B series. Now for me, we didn't do that when I was young. So basically I had to get that um, as an, a young adult because I had to have that before I went into the nursing program so you guys are set so you know you guys have it a little bit easier than I did because you had these immunizations done you know while you were born hepatitis C hepatitis C is another bloodborne pathogen so again you know something you can get through blood um, and uh, hepatitis C is one of the most prevalent Hepatitis. Now, when I talk about hepatitis, let's go back to med terminology last year. Okay. So first we had hepat, hepat liver. Then we had itis, inflammation. Right, inflammation. It was itis, itis, inflammation. So um, hepatitis is inflammation of the liver. You guys are awesome. Okay. All right. So. HIV, HIV you have to have, which will eventually turn into AIDS later on. Now the problem with HIV is that it annihilates your immune system. So most people don't actually die from HIV, they die from whatever sickness they catch because their body can't fight off sicknesses, okay? So it's not usually the HIV in and of itself that causes that. HIV, the whole process of that is once your immune system gets down to a certain level, when we test uh, and do your blood work and test your immune system, 
once it gets to a certain low, then we start calling it AIDS. So the difference between HIV and AIDS has to do with just how poorly your immune system is functioning. Now, the good thing about HIV is outside of the body, like if there's blood on a countertop or blood on a needle end, things like that, um, the good thing about that is it does not survive well outside of the body. So that's a good thing. So at least you have a better chance if you touch dry blood or something like that because HIV doesn't live very well outside of the body. However, it can, besides being found in blood, it can be found in saliva, which is spit, spit. good, and tears, crying, and sweat, crying, and sweat. So moving on to Hep B. Hep B, you have between one and one and a quarter million people that are chronically infected. So if it's a chronic infection, what does that mean? It's not it's never going away. It ain't going away. Super. So the symptoms you're gonna see are jaundice. Does anybody know what jaundice is? It's like yellow when you're a baby, skin. you turn yellow. Right, yellowing skin. Or the first place you're gonna see is in the eyes, like the whites of your eyes. Actually, they look more yellow in someone. You'll see that first before you'll even notice it on their skin. So why that well, that has to do with um, just the trauma of birth. Sometimes, if, if there's a lot of uh, trauma to the body, like you get too much, um, just the product of that it starts that yelling process, or you know maybe they're not developed fully yet. The liver is is still kind of trying to get up to speed, and you see a lot of that sometimes. All right, so symptoms include jaundice, fatigue, which is Tired, we all suffer from that like every day, right? Abdominal pain, loss of appetite, nausea off and on, as well as vomiting, okay? So that's the symptoms you're gonna see. Now, again, this could lead to chronic liver disease once you have hepatitis B. That's why it's a big deal. That's why we really worry about it because we don't want you living with liver disease the rest of your life. Again, it could cause cancer of the liver, and of course, you can die from Hep B. So, since in 1982, they decided and came up and developed this vaccine and decided to, you know, start vaccinating people to try to keep us from getting Hep B. Now, the thing about HBV that you're going to want to remember is that even in dried blood, Hep B can survive for one week. That's a long time. So outside of the body, even on um, a tabletop or something like that, you know, it can survive for one week. So that's really important to know. Hep C, that is actually the most common chronic bloodborne infection in the United States. So again, because it's hepatitis, you're always gonna see jaundice. Anytime that you have inflammation in your liver, and something attacking your liver, problems with your liver, you're gonna see that jaundice. And again, fatigue, abdominal pain, loss of appetite, intermittent nausea, vomiting. So these are like the exact same symptoms we just said for Hep B, right? And again, it's because of what part of the body is, is, is being attacked and inflamed, okay? It's any, these, are chron, these are classic liver problem symptoms, okay? So, we look at chronic liver disease because of this, and again, death. So it's very, very bad. So what am I looking at? What do I need to worry about in order to catch this? Well, first of all, it's blood. Blood's the biggie, so that's why it's called a blood-borne pathogen, right? Then we have saliva, urine, vomit. And in healthcare, you're gonna be around that stuff a lot. Semen or vaginal secretions. Okay, sex, right? And that could include things like oral sex. Okay, skin, tissue, cell cultures, things like that. Again, in healthcare, you're gonna be around a lot more um, 
more exposure to people's body and body parts and, and, and things like that than you ever would be in, in, in otherwise in, in life, okay? So any other body fluids is what we have to look for. Now, how are you going to get it? Well, because it's in blood, obviously accidentally touching somebody's blood. So what ways could that happen in clinicals? In the clinical setting, how might you come in contact with somebody's blood? Like you said, she's just putting a bandaid on. Okay, wound care. She's like she said, maybe you're just putting a band-aid on somebody. Needles. Some needles. Nosebleeds. Nosebleeds. Great. Coughing up blood. Absolutely. Okay. So there's lots of ways because you know, unfortunately, I have seen crazy weird things. I have walked into a patient's room before and I have seen a needle sticking into somebody's bed. Okay. Where the nurse instead of um which again this was back before we had a lot of needles that will like once you're done with it you push a button the needle pops back into um kind of the container the needle container and will actually keep you from sticking yourself but i've seen nurses give somebody a shot and then while they're putting the band-aid on blah 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 stick it in someone's bed mattress to keep from sticking themselves or somebody else and then walk off and forget to <laughs> grab it and then put it in the sharps container. So really weird stuff. Okay, and that's even like in housekeeping, they have to watch when they're like taking someone's bed linens off that someone didn't accidentally leave a needle or something in someone's bed. Okay. All right, good. All right, mucous membranes, eyes, nose, mouth. If someone has a cold or uh, things like that, if you're, if you're doing mouth care, maybe you're handling somebody's dentures, okay? Take them out of their mouth, okay? That, that all are activities you could do to be exposed to things like saliva. Non-intact skin, what does that mean? A wound, or some type of wound, correct. And then again, contaminated sharps and eels, which we kind of covered. Now, ways to get exposed in work in general would be some type of industrial accident, administering first aid, post-accident cleanup, because you guys will have, um, and, and there are a lot of rules and regulations if there's blood, vomit, whatever, on the floor, urine, there's a lot of rules and regulations as to what exact cleaner you have to use. And like there's all these spill kits and things that you have to use and you'll actually learn how to correctly clean up spills and things like that. Janitorial or maintenance work, okay? All right, so we, we talked about the goals of this presentation. We're gonna be the basics of bloodborne diseases, exposure, prevention, and then we're gonna have a quiz, okay? right so when you go to a facility they are going to have a plan as to what happens if you are exposed okay and, and I have done it before in home health I was drawing blood took the needle out and went to push the button or do whatever to to click it back in and actually poke my finger, drag it across my finger and poke myself. Okay, so again, when that happens, then all of a sudden this exposure plan goes into effect. Okay, so first, um, in order to have a plan, you need to know, okay, potential exposure determination. You, you need to know, okay, how can we become exposed to in this job? Who in my workplace is, is likely to be exposed you know, which employees are gonna be exposed, things like that. Then I need to know safe work practices. What do I need to do to try to keep from getting exposed, right? Decontaminating equipment. How do I clean it up after this has happened? Selecting and using PPE. What is PPE? Personal protective equipment. Right, personal protective equipment. And what would be examples of that? Gloves, Gloves masks, goggles, gowns, gowns. right. 
perfect. Okay. And then handling bio waste. What is bio waste? Right, it, it's things that cannot go into a regular trash can because why? Because there's some too much body. Right, there is something, there, there's body fluids, blood, something from this person that is on whatever this waste is, whether it's like gauze or band-aids or whatever, that um, could potentially infect somebody. So we have to dispose of it, like you said, differently. Now, labels and signs. We have to have, we, we do have a special label for biohazard waste or a sharp container, things like that. Uh, so that even if you can't read, you will know which one is biohazard waste, okay? And again, training requirements. You're getting this training now before you can even go into clinicals. And again, you'll get it every year. No matter what job you have, you'll get it every year. Just as a reminder, just to give you updates, things like that, because it's so important. Record keeping requirements. Um, we always report and, and have records of anyone who ever has any type of exposure incident. There, there's a lot of record keeping going on with things like that. So who are we gonna train? Well, anybody that could come into contact with blood and body fluids, right? And again, anybody that's been trained in first aid or CPR, which is you guys, okay? So, universal precautions. The thing about universal precautions, we treat all blood and body fluids as if they are contaminated, okay? Don't, and, and we don't think about that sometimes with elderly people because we don't feel like they're out shooting up heroin and sleeping around, right? But even, um, again, hepatitis, things like that can be a chronic illness. So even elderly folks could have had hepatitis for 20, 30 years, okay? So again, we're gonna treat every blood and body fluid like it's contaminated. We're gonna make sure that we clean it up according to the plan. Um, we're going to use protective equipment like we talked about, uh, latex gloves. If it's just like a wound that's bleeding somewhat, if it is spurting blood, like it's shooting out, like you would see on Hollywood in the movies, you know, no matter what they do, it's like a big squirt of blood everywhere, things like that. You're going to need gloves, but you're also going to need like some sort of a gown to protect you from getting it all over your clothes. Maybe like a mask to protect your face. Eye protection as well. If you don't wear glasses, things like goggles, and face shields, things like that. Um, if you are just cleaning up a mask, you're gonna need gloves on. If you're doing janitorial work, they wear gloves. So, decontamination. Once we get a spill or something to clean up, we have to make sure, again, we're wearing gloves, which we just said. We have to have a specific disinfectant cleaner that is in a specific bodily fluid kit. Okay, you have to have a special kit with a special cleaner. And again, um, if you don't have that special kit, you can make your own by using a ratio of one quarter cup of bleach to one gallon of water, okay? So you could have like a spray bottle mixed up with that solution, would be something that you could use. And believe it or not, using more bleach that it calls for is, is actually not good, not as effective. I mean, you kind of think it would be, but, or hey, I'll pour straight up bleach on it, but actually this particular ratio is the, uh, you know, scientifically that is what they know works the best, okay? So again, always, always, always properly dispose of any kind of, of uh, PPE, towels, rags, anything that's contaminated, okay, in a biohazard place. Now, if you, for some reason, get blood on your clothes or have blood on uh, gloves, gowns, things like that, always get it off as soon as you can. Make sure you're cleaning any affected equipment, countertops, anything with that solution. Wash immediately after exposure. Wash your hands immediately, even though you've had gloves on, okay? And then, of course, any contaminated items we're gonna dispose of in a biohazard 
area, right? Now, when I talk about regulated medical waste, that's going to be things like liquid or semi-liquid blood, okay, or OPIM, which basically is other potentially infect infectious materials, right? Uh, any contaminated item that could release blood or OPIM when compressed, if something is squeezed, okay, if it makes the blood come out of it, then we have to throw in medical waste. Or any contaminated sharks, or any type of pathological or microbiological waste that has any type of blood or OPIM in it, okay? And again, sometimes you think more about like laboratory tests that deal with like uh, tissue samples they have to look at and, and, and deal with, okay? So, labels and signs, you can see here the universal biohazard label, and it has to be attached to any kind of container, like a trash can for biohazard waste. It has to be on any type of refrigerator or freezer, which again, I think more of like a laboratory because you have to keep certain samples refrigerated, okay? And any type of container that you use to transport or ship blood. When I did home health, I'd go get somebody's blood at their home, and I had a special biohazard container that I would put that blood sample in, like the tubes of blood, as I transported it back to the hospital to, to take to the lab so they could test it, okay? Now, again, Hep B vaccine, you, um, no matter what job you get, and even here at school, like every year, I have to either give them a copy of my hepatitis B immunizations or sign a waiver saying I realize that I could get Hep B and I'm probably gonna be exposed, but I, I choose not to get it. Now again, for you guys, most of you already had it. As an employer, they have to provide Hep B vaccines at no cost to the employee. And again, they have to have a sign a decl declination form if they choose not to. You guys have to do all this even to be in the MA program. Now, if there's been an exposure, then if you've had specific contact with blood or OPIM, then <coughs> that, is, that would be like an exposure incident. Now, if there are no infiltrations, that means something got into your mucous membranes, which is your eyes and nose, right? Or any open skin, if you had a cut or a wound, then it's not considered occupational exposure. So just because you accidentally touched some blood, unless you had a cut there, or some way for that to get into your body, that's not truly considered an exposure incident. Now it is when you stick yourself with a needle because you poke the needle through your skin, okay? If blood, but technically if you accidentally got blood on your finger and you went and wiped your eye because it was itching and got blood in your eye, that would be considered an exposure incident, okay? You have to report all incidences with that. And again, once you do, you will have a post-exposure medical examination. Okay, very important. So what they're gonna do is, everything is very, very confidential if you did actually get exposed to something. And first of all, they're gonna document the route of exposure. How did that gain entrance into your body? Okay, then they're gonna identify the source individual. Okay, who, where did this blood come from? Then they're actually gonna test that patient if, as long as they consent, they'll start testing them for all those blood-borne diseases to see if they have Hep B, Hep C, HIV, things like that, okay? And usually the patients will consent. And again, uh, once they get the results of that patient, they will send them to you and let you know, okay, well, you know, we tested the patient, the patient's clean, so you are not at risk for getting Hepatitis B, C, HIV, whatever, okay? Again, um, records include, they will always want to know if you've had your Hep B vaccination. Or they are also going to uh, record any time there's an incident and exactly what they did to follow up after that. 
and the records are going to include they have to like have all this documentation about where they trained you about bloodborne pathogens the contents of what was in the training and the name and qualifications of the trainer so even today there will be a record that you had bloodborne pathogen training by me miss hungerford rn and what i saw on okay all right summary what is universal precautions you treat all the oh, body Right. You treat all blood and body fluids as if it were contaminated. Okay. PPE and safe work practices. Okay. We talked about what you need to wear according to what situation. Mainly, like everything includes gloves, so we're always wearing gloves. And then it just depends on where else you might get it on you as to whether you start including gown, face shields, and eye, you know, eye protection, things like that. Decontamination. We talked about how you need to decontaminate everything with a mixture of quarter bleach and a gallon of water. Four, right, fourth cup of bleach to a gallon of water. And we talked about the exposure incident. So we talked about what exactly means to be an exposure or what is not an exposure. Okay, so it has to enter your body some way to actually be an exposure. Then what happens? You Once you get exposed. <laughs> Yeah, you have to have some follow-up. So they're going to test your patient. They're going to have all these records and reports of it, and 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 make sure you're not you don't have cooties now. All right.